Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone across the region. You are watching Territories Talk. I'm Ron Grant out of Tortola in the Virgin Islands. And our guest today is the one and only Mr. Mishak Alford, who is the president of the St. Kitts Consortium of Farmers and Food Producers. Uh, now, viewers, today we are going to be discussing, of course, growing fresh fruit and vegetable products, and also how the benefits uh, of neighboring islands and partnerships could really help to advance the agricultural sector, not only for the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, but as a region, how we could come together and make sure that we're moving in the best direction. Uh, again, I want to welcome each and every one of you uh, from across the region, and I want to take this opportunity to welcome our guest, Mr. Mishak Alford. Uh, Mr. Alford, thank you so much for your time, and welcome to Territories Talk. I thank you for having me. Indeed. Now, I mentioned, uh, of course, that you are president of the St. Kitts Consortium of Farmers and Food Producers. But before we get into that organization and its role, uh, briefly tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Oh, uh, well, you know, I have been in farming, the field of agriculture, for just over about 10 years now. Um, I've been working mostly in the area of crop cultivation and then recently moved into some livestock production. I uh, recently became the president of the consortium of Farmers and Food Producers here on St. Kitts, which is an organization that is just about three years old. And so we've been moving together to kind of bring farmers together under one umbrella as much as possible to advance into the cause. How would you say that journey has uh, been for the consortium in the past two years uh, in, in really bridging the gap between uh, farmers and fisher folk in, in the Federation? Well, we, we, we are a farmer producer organization primarily focusing on livestock okay. and also uh, our production. We have not ventured yet at least to deal with matters to do with um, the fisher folk. Uh, the, the journey uh, for us would have started, as I said, sometime late 2021, they vote. And you know, this was period just after COVID and the, and, and the follows from COVID-19 when farmers were having a lot of discussions uh, individually in small groups unofficially. Uh, a lot of the what we're doing is stemming from the whole notion of the whole concept of food security and what it means when people here think it's a need and the vision and looking back at the, the initiatives, the policies and strategies over the last 30 odd years, we recognize that you know the same things have been been promoted for those period of time and there have been little implementation in that regard. And we were looking principally at recent policy measures to to help to jumpstart the agricultural sector in the, in the period of a crisis, mm -hmm. uh, post a crisis, which is COVID-19. And also reflecting on other crises in the region, which include um, storm activities that which we get almost every uh, annually, and also looking at crises in the past, and how every time during these moments, we often uh, refer to our farmers, our agricultural producers as the army in the fight for food security. But as soon as the, the, the crisis would abate. Again, our direction, our, our attempts to improve the agricultural sector and the sector falls just at the same time. And so and the farm community basically and the consortium is looking at the state of the farmers, state of the producers, the island of St. Kitts in particular, and looking to see how we can truly advance uh, the farming community by getting them more empowered, putting more power and control in the hands of the producer. I'm happy that you mentioned uh, advancing. What would you say it would take to advance agriculture in the Federation of St. Kitts and, and, and Nevis? What is needed from your vantage point? Well, from the vantage point of the consortium, uh, we have been pretty much concerned that the farming community um, has little to no voice in the decision making and policy making of, of the government and the Ministry of Agriculture. And this is spanning across you know, decades. And so what we are saying is that, you know, the, the consortium on a whole is advancing a number of, of is advancing a number of areas. One principal area is the voice. But when we started our discussions very early on at the inception of the organization, we thought it was important to dialogue with those who are in the sector as much as possible, which, which is an ongoing process because we're learning every time. We started speaking with uh, the farmers principally. And they would have said, we have no say in what mm. direction we are taking. Uh, second thing that we would have identified is access to financing. 
you know, uh, would put the facilities to help them to basically plan the tree a little bit better. They spoke also again about the marketing issues, not having proper domestic market for their produce. And one would, one would say that, you know, what sense does it make to grow something when you don't know where you're going to market that product? Nowhere in the world you will see that be, be practiced. And it's not good business in, a, in any essence. And the conversation would have continued into the areas of infrastructure development, investments in those areas. Keenly also looking at the human capacity, developing our, our ability to as, as you say, produce and gaining knowledge and, and new technologies being integrated in our operations and production uh, uh, systems. We also would have considered to a large extent our relationship with the Ministry of Agriculture and that we can be operating in silos, that we must be able to develop a, a framework of collaboration and not working in opposition to each other. And so you have to look at the institutions and the organizations that we are building and how much we are um, vested in organized production uh, to meet the national and regional objectives. Understood. One of the things that you highlighted earlier uh, would have to be as it pertains to policy. And I'd like to, of course, uh, implement, uh, input their legislation. At present, what are the policies uh, and legislation that really govern the agriculture sector in, in, in the Federation? Well, you know, by and large, uh, let's look at the policy framework um, a little, little bit wider, other than the legislation. There have been over the years, not only in St. Kitts and Nevis, but across the region, uh, many policies and programs that have come, come about to basically improve uh, production uh, for the region and to, to reduce our import bill. And so many of the new issues we are hearing today are not really new. The source has been actually the same. Uh, in St. Kitts and Nevis, we've had uh, various developmental strategies over, over, over the last couple uh, of years, over the last decades, uh, to see how we can also make those, those same kind of, of strides in, in the sector. When it comes to policy and, 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 um, and, and legislation and sound to support the agricultural development in the region and in the Caribbean, I don't think there's a dearth on these things. Of course, you could always see how you could harmonize some of these legislation and policies. What is clear, even in, in policy and research um, documents and, and, and written reports over the, over the years, and even most recently, documents that were put together by the Caribbean um, sector organization, all do indicate that there is not a lack of programs, there's a lack of implementation, and the will, political will, to administer a number of these things. So, I mean, of course, policy and legal um, initiatives are good in terms of creating an enabling environment to ensure. Of course, from a, from a legislation and, and regulation standpoint, we would like to start seeing measures as it relates to further incentivizing the sector so that you can have more private sector involvement creating that environment that you, you, you eliminate um, a lot of the, the risks that are involved so that persons can be a bit more confident and motivated to get into the sector, especially for young persons. I understand. Uh, thank you for sharing. I, I have to ask you, as it pertains to the consortium, uh, what is your membership like? How many uh, members uh, representing the agriculture field are presently uh, a part of the consortium? Thank you for that question. Um, the consortium of farmers and food producers uh, started off um, looking at more individual membership. And at that stage, we, we started off perhaps the conversation very small with about 10 major farmers uh, or more, 10 to 13 farmers or more around the around the island. We, we quickly moved to incorporate and involve a number of the farming societies, the organizations. And so when we do decide how we calculate our membership, we can go based on individual membership plus the, our, our collective membership, because we have presidents of various organizations who are sitting at the leadership of the consortium, and that is how it's structured, essential. So there's a general membership and there's also the leadership. Uh, aspect of it, which comes from different organizations. In our last count or so, we're looking at about 120 in terms of membership in the in farming community and, and growing because up to yesterday and this morning, we're getting requests for, for persons to, to join. Wonderful. I have to ask you, uh, when it comes to farming, uh, there is oftentimes a bit of a generational gap. And by mm -hmm. that, I mean some of the younger persons within our, our societies aren't too keen on uh, um, making this not only a, a, a form of livelihood, but but essentially, I don't think many of them understand the importance of food security. Is it similar in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis? Do you have uh, young persons uh, who are interested in the field of agriculture? 
Yeah, of course. Um, you, you will hear the popular narrative now that you know farming is a business. Um, it's been repeated and circulated every time. The persons who are involved, I actually consider myself a young person, I'm, and I'm involved in agriculture. Um, there are young uh, members in our organization, uh, at least about 25% con con considered youth, 25%, uh, and persons who have showed interest. It, it, uh, the entry into agriculture is not as easy as one would like it to be. Um, there, there are a lot of constraints uh, that, that are faced by anyone who wants to get into the sector to begin to fly and cheer. Of course, there's a knowledge uh, and the learning curve that they have to go around. And if you look across the region, you would recognize that most of the the, the, the countries who, who would have um, ventured into local domestic production, they are, they are technocrats, they are technical experts, experts who go off to the, the regional institutes for learning, actually embedded in the agricultural departments and in the ministries rather than playing the field uh, uh, working practically uh, as farmers themselves. And so there's normally that gap in terms of knowledge and technical know-how and capacity, and which makes entry into, in, into the sector a bit challenging for some person, because by the time you're learning, you start learning, you would have cost you so much already. That's why so, so many farm, young farmers don't reach as far into it as they could. But there is a, a lot of interest. Uh, when I look at the last meeting of the consortium in, in 2023, just in December there, and I saw the, the persons who came out, young women, young men, are showing interest in being in the sector. It's, you just need to get that measure of support. You know, and that's okay. what the consortium is, uh, is, is really looking forward to see how we can begin to increase the amount of capacity development sessions so that farmers find it a bit easier to get access to the necessary information. One of the things also you, you would want to consider is that uh, in terms of market information, when you're looking to do your own assessment as to how, where do you enter, you know, what do you go into, we have a dearth again, a lack of, of that information um, that is um, affecting us. And so, I, as I would sometimes describe, sometimes we're planting in the wind, we're just hoping um, after we plant certain things. And hopefully we can, in the near future, get some structure in, in place, some mechanism in place that can begin to provide that kind of market information that inform not only how what we produce how we produce it in terms of a guy but also understanding who you're producing it for and who. and so that is also part of the problem that is um, affecting us on side land tenureship is a big concern uh if you want to see investments in agriculture further you recognize it requires that persons have a better relationship with their land whether whether it's through longer term lease arrangements or outright ownership because it, 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 it's an investment and, it, and it, to, to, to start off in the field can take a bit um, before you can start seeing the returns. Yes. But you, nobody, no one wants to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into a, a land area and they don't have any kind of true control over what they're investing in. So that, that is another, another area of, of, of barrier to entry that we are facing here in, in so many respects. Understood. I have to uh, ask you, for persons who are not familiar with the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, can you paint us a picture of what the uh, the local domestic uh, agriculture sector looks like and feels like uh, in St. Kitts? Well, there's you... always the, the Ministry of Agriculture who, who, who has a particular mandate. Within it, there's a Department of Agriculture, um, which really is where most of the technical um, aspects of the, the ministry is uh, resides. Um, normally, uh, in that sector, in that um, sector, you will have, uh, sorry, in that department, you will have areas to do with livestock, crops, the engineering unit, different aspects of it set up where to provide certain services. It's also supposed to have some extension services as well, extended to farmers. And so there's also the veterinary um, style of things that um, advance um, extension service in that regard. Um, there are a number of organizations, uh, farming societies out there. Um, including from the beekeeping, in the poultry, and uh, from uh, on that side, you also have different crop cultivation um, organizations and so on set up in, in, in that regard. Uh, the inside the ministry on the farm that of agriculture, there is also a kind of mapping unit for, um, that is responsible for so assisting farmers to get in their produce to so, um, the local market in some respects. And it's been there's some recent work being done in that area, we've seen some progress there. 
they, they, the ministry would have certain installations out there, including they have a tour um, where you take your, your animals to be slaughtered and processed. There's also um, a, a projected a stock farm um, facility to be worked on and improved over time. And so there are a number of installations, or there are some outstations as well in the rural areas, at least two, one in the Tabernacle area and one in the Forest uh, Newport area, which is more in the rural sites. The main uh, plant for agriculture is actually the vast in the city area, an area called Labrit, right? And then you will have private entities who are involved in in um, the, the procurement and the sale of, of uh, inputs. Um, the local um, hardware, major stores and uh, markets, and also you have also seed companies to help to support some of these things, right? Understood. Now, when it comes to the uh, support, you mentioned earlier on, um, you know, the, the, the consortium really works closely with being a voice for, um, you know, farmers in the Federation. Mm -hmm. Mr. Alfred, would you say that the sector is being given the attention and financing that it needs from your local government? We started a conversation, and it is a continuous one, as I said, two years ago. We started uh, a conversation because of the serious challenges the farmers are facing and have been facing. It's, it's been difficult because there's a particular mindset that we know is not going to be easily uh, changed or replaced. But we also understand that we have to be consistent and we have to talk wide, far, as deep as possible. And so the conversation we are having is not only with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture, but also with the, far the farming community, the banking um, fraternity. We are also meeting with the media persons and so on as much as possible because the narrative seems to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. as saying that farmers essentially uh, are not consistent in, in producing and even the the reports and plans and policy documents and so on of the government and of other agencies speak in that fashion, all right? But essentially, you, there's always that perspective that's lacking, which is the farmer's perspective, basically presenting to you what challenges they are facing. It's been a difficult uh, 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 journey, it's, but it has been one that has offered us much to learn because it's important to understand why persons make the decisions they are making. Uh, and why, what, what is conditioning them. But well, we've come to that point uh, in terms of our developmental thrust to note that we're going to have to not only um, lobby in mm -hmm. terms of moving from, from walking the halls of power as much as possible to, to bring attention to some of these issues to make them understand that the organizations um, need to, to bring to be brought front and center in the conversations we are having about these these members this 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 community of farmers and producers, but also too we are also much on the radio in the media as much as possible these days, because in order for the in order for change to come there must be a change in the narrative and an understanding of what is the position of the farming community and nobody is best suited to discuss the farming issues other than the farmer he, him or herself. And so advocacy is part of, 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 our, of, our, of our drive. Also too, networking. You know, mm -hmm. reaching out to other organizations who are similarly, similarly um, set up, um, similar value systems and support and concerns. Though those institutions that have been involved long before we would have started, so that we can learn. All of it is a learning process. And we believe that we are on a journey. And so we are taking it in, um, in good spirit God, if it's good news for us or bad news for us, we're learning and, we, and make, trying to make that, that switch. But also to, uh, the, as I said earlier, how do we begin to develop our human resource? How, we, how do we develop, develop the capacity of our farmers to continue to produce? It's very difficult, the conditions are, that are out there. So therefore, we must be able to link all farmers with, yes. with, with, with those institutions that can provide that kind of capacity development. And so we have to also begin now to chart our own plan as an entity, our own roadmap as to the direction that we need to go in, especially starting in this new year. When you look across the region, uh, Mr. Uh, Alford, is there a particular country that you would say is leading or could be looked at as an example as it pertains to agriculture? Well, most of what I see, uh, 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 and I don't want to speak um, 
we need the greater authority in that area. But most of what I see is mostly what I see news items and um, you know what is posted in the social media platforms of the various countries and the organizations that they have. And that some of the things that are very inspiring. Uh, I have seen in recent um, article which shows what is happening in places like St. Lucia, in Guyana, Jamaica, in terms of the investments already made to, to, to go after the target of the 25 by 2025. And, and for that reason, you, you become a bit inspired at least the movement has truly started. We are yet to see um, that kind of uh, turn in, in St. Kitts at the moment. We are hopeful. Um, we, we, we have seen and heard the new budget presentations. Um, we've um, been uh, see like um, at least presentations of the 25 by 25 plan for, for, for St. Kitts. There's some, there's some, you know, there's buckets of, of, of hope in it. However, we, we are still waiting as we would normally do to see how these things will be rolled out and implemented how much the farming community and cultural community and a whole private sector will be thoroughly involved in these things from the very inception. And so in terms of um, identifying a particular country of sorts, I mean, up to recently as yesterday, I saw that there is a, a some credit facility being devised in Dominica, right? Um, um, to, to support farmers in the production of, 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 of uh, white potatoes. Uh, that is interesting to us because it's one of the things that we, we, we've been trying to promote um, with the Ministry of Agriculture to, to ha uh, help us in that regard, at least to fashion or facilitate the conversation with the Balkan community. But one of the challenges we've been having here locally is, is that farmers are not considered, uh, I must I must speak of farms, I know this is almost the same experience across the region, as they're not considered largely as, as being bankable. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the conditions of loans and so on is sometimes uh, very extreme to a point that you can really don't really want to basically incorporate those in your operation because it's, it's too costly, um, a financing mechanism. But when I see what I see in um, Dominica, it's also inspiring to say, here's an example here in, in Dominica that we, we, we've been talking about. Um, this is one in St. Lucia, this is one in, in Jamaica and so on. And also too, these are things that we have been promoting because of our own experiences, noting that we need help in certain areas. Wonderful. I want to take this opportunity to uh, welcome our viewers from across the region. We have persons um, uh, tuning in, of course. Uh, today is election day uh, in St. Martin, uh, but today we are discussing agriculture and food security with the man Mishak Alford out of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Of course, if you have any questions or concerns or comments, uh, feel free to send us a message and we'll be happy to address them uh, as best we can. Uh, continuing on, uh, as it pertains to uh, the education in agriculture, I have to ask you, is it taught in your local schools in the Federation? Uh, what are some of the programs that are incorporated, if any, uh, to introduce young persons as early as possible to the agriculture sector? Well, personally, I'm, I'm an agricultural student. I mean, going to primary school, high school, that was a, a, a subject matter that I was always interested in. It was one of my favorite subjects early on. And so I know that at least from the left of the primary school, um, for most of the years, agriculture was in that program. I think um, even more recent years, it was inculcated in the curriculum of the local college. And so at least it, there are some measures and steps to ensure that that, that persons are and we afforded that opportunity to learn it at from those levels. So yes, there, there are measures there um, to, to, to do that. But I, I don't see, I, I can't speak with, 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 with numbers in, in that respect in terms of the conversion over into the field. As I said earlier today, based on the reports um, demonstrated, even those persons who, who go up to these um, Caribbean institutes of agriculture, they most of the time they return to work inside of the ministries and inside of the departments as, as technocrats rather than um, uh, farmers in the field. So, I mean, that, 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 this is where you might see where the gap is, right? And so the, the technical knowledge um, that is to be, to, uh, well, the technical knowledge don't necessarily reside with the farmer at the level you might want, uh, at least in the spread that you would want. And so on. most farmers actually learn the trade over a long period of time. You could imagine if they get some upfront training very early on, they could basically leapfrog um, in that regard. Understood. Now, I am very familiar with the Federation of, of St. Kitts and Nevis, and I've had the opportunity to visit on many occasions. Um, give us some examples of, of the products 
agriculture products that are are harvested locally? Am I what interested? Am I yes. interested? Um, okay. I, I I could speak. Uh, well, I want to um, pivot off of that question just to uh, say something that I might have missed earlier. Sure. Consortium of farmers having gone around having discussions with media, with bank, with the Ministry of Agriculture, the ministers, the Prime Minister, everybody. Um, we know that there that the real problem they had with the farming companies is that we are not being consistent in our production. And that is why a lot of times people won't find the market uh, for stuff. Well, even though we disagree in principle on that, on that matter, we, we decided to take a decision in our leadership meeting that we are going to start a planting program. Finally, this is where a number of farmers will come together and focus on different crops. Um, some crop items, uh, particularly the bell peppers, the green peppers, uh, you know, we, we call it sweet peppers, um, carrots, onions, and we also said we do some cantaloupes, honeydew melons, cabbages, and so on. So Transatium looked at around six different crop items to focus on for this crop season. And so the, um, just to give you, yeah, this is about six of the 14 crops that we have perhaps were identified in the 25 or 25 uh, strategy for 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 for, for Saint Kitts and Nevis. So we, we decided to tackle it in that way so that we can begin not only to record for ourselves but have the monthly unit record what we're doing. So on our end we are recording more on the production side challenges, what we plan, how much we plan, how it's going over time, the challenges we are facing. And then also from the on the other end the monthly unit is taking record of the harvesting aspect of things. The reason why we're doing this this way is because at the end of the day, um, we would have set our targets and we want to make our contribution to the 25 by 25, even though most of us are not too clear on what this is. But we want to show that we are willing to collaborate with the Ministry of Agriculture and them basically trying to localize because it is a, what, that which is a Caribbean initiative. But more importantly for us is to demonstrate to ourselves, demonstrate to the wider uh, public and those who are having conversations on the subject matter that we can produce consistent. But during that process, we have to effectively keep, keep our records. And to demonstrate that during this period here, that not only were we not able to start the planting season on time, but we've now got an abnormal job period as well. So those persons who are um, relying, which is majority of farmers, majority of farmers relying on rain fed agriculture, then you will see or the results are given our conditions, right? And so no longer are we going to just be talking off the top of our head based on our individual experiences. We're taking record of all this and so on to assist us in our own individual and collective decision making, but also in our communication and conversation with the ministry to say, look, from experiential learning, we would like to suggest this, right? And hopefully we can come up with a better um, grasp in terms of authority on the matter. Now, we, we 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 also understand even now starting the, the, the this planting program in september late very late on the 22nd which means planting actually started in october before the rain started falling for us here and then right after that you find hardly any rain up until today which is kind of strange right now we're recording all those challenges and and hopefully at the end of our planting program, which is supposed to be a six months planting program, I think we're on the fifth planting um, for like tomatoes, sorry, sweet peppers, then we can be able to, we can be able to now get in the, the process of reporting on this um, in, in, in a real way. Now, we're doing this because um, we're not trying to make any kind of case towards the government more so. We are trying to make a case to ourselves. Because right now, we believe and we have seen and you asked a question earlier basically to grasp what is the relationship like between ministry and 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 consortium and, and the family yeah. community it's because we've reached that point we are we recognize and we're hoping that the government can recognize that the farmers has to be able to not only be empowered but also empower themselves and arm themselves with the necessary information and knowledge and and the hope is the greatest hope for us is that we begin to see farmers as truly a business people to, to engage very early on in, in, in the processes. There's no reason 
why you will start a program, launch any program before you consult with the farming community. These are the people who are supposed to carry this program through. These are the implementers. And unfortunately, too much of our policies across the region, so we start at the regional level, even at the national levels, do not incorporate those persons you'll have to carry down. And there's always that gap because there's no clarity in terms of the, of the vision. And, and this doesn't filter down far enough to those who are actually going to work and going to do space. Understood. And I want to take this opportunity for, to thank you uh, for your authenticity and your honesty. Uh, one of the, the, the things we, we sometimes uh, fail to realize is that uh, we have more in common as a region uh, than we are uh, uh, differences. Uh, we have quite a bit of similarities. And of course, the aim of Territories uh, Talk is really to connect the region through conversation. Uh, of course, when it comes to agriculture and food security, it is of paramount importance uh, and concern to the entire region. I don't see us though, however, uh, really uh, taking it seriously. Um, I, I don't see us really understanding the importance of uh, moving from good to great when it comes to food security. And I do want to take this opportunity just to commend you and your organization for uh, the work that you're doing in the Federation, uh, despite, of course, of the, the, the various challenges. I want to give you an opportunity to speak to the younger generation, perhaps myself and you. Uh, what would you say to them as it pertains to uh, really bringing home the importance of getting involved in the agriculture sector? Just the question. When I got into um, agriculture, when I got into farming and all, uh, it, it stemmed from an experience I had outside of the region. I was in South Africa at the time um, on a, a course of study. And I was there with my other classmates um, leaving the University of Aberdeen with our professor, very few of us. And we were studying the conditions. I'm an environmental um, environmentalist and also physical planner, all right, by profession. We were studying the conditions of what you call it, well, the vegetation around farms and so on in that area. And we were in the region in South Africa. We were staying on a farm that had some semblance of tourism involved in it, where you could go there, stay, to eat from the land, and all these different things. And we were basically assessing the, the area to understand what conditions are affecting the farmer from producing well. We, uh, we ask those socioeconomic questions as well as if, and we look at the physical evidence of the problem. But we, we, we were on one farm and we moved to another farm, uh, very, very uh, three hours distance away in driving time. When we got to that farm, we were on the mountain. And I remember we were, we were asking the questions, you know, why? Why can't you produce the way you would like to produce? And I remember keep referring to the government and government policies and initiatives are bad. And I couldn't understand because they, he had so much land, right? We were on a mountain and the mountain was his land. Mm -hmm. And when I asked him, and I was a bit skeptical, I'm the only dark skinned person in the group, you know, coming from Scotland, and he was a white South African. But I couldn't leave that experience without asking the question. And I, I put my hand up like a, like a child in a classroom and I asked him, could you please show me the extent of your land? And he pointed to lands as far as the eyes can see, literally, South Africa you're in, and you see other mountains in his land. Rivers running through his land. Game, wild animals running, running through his land. And he doesn't have enough land to do what he wants. That is where my concept, the value of land, change in terms of wealth creation and everything else. And whenever we're talking about uh, land here, especially in Sinkets, who lack access to a lot of their lands, individual, individuals have access to lands very late, um, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000 square feet of land seem to be a lot of land. But when it comes to Wealth and wealth creation and, and to create businesses and so on. And if COVID 19 taught us anything, is that we can't rely on some of these transnational corporations to keep us on. Mm -hmm. And when you see the amount of persons who are terminated are sent home during that period, one group of persons I know for sure wasn't so frightened was a farmer who had access to his land and was for know how to produce 
and to create a basis out of it as hard as the conditions were and now. And so the value of, 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 of the land and what we do with it, everything as an environmental person, everything that you have in front of you came from yourselves, came out of the environment. Whatever we produce, whenever we produce nature. And so in the St. Kitts and Naves in particular, and most of us in the Caribbean who don't have oil and gold and precious metals and minerals, is soil. And, 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 and our sea is where we generate um, our, our wealth from. And so I would like to put for the young persons who are considering anything going on. It doesn't matter what you're going to get into real estate or anything else, you still come back to the land. So make sure early on to put your stake down. And starting with farming in my case, you know, I am a far away from where I was when I started some nine, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. I started with very little knowledge, practical knowledge, of course, it's some theory, but linked in with the elders. And I'm not saying old people, but with the elders in terms of experience. Right. Yes. So that, so that, and they are willing to transfer a lot of that knowledge because they took a long time to, um, to, to accrue that knowledge, but they are also very willing to share it so that you don't have to go through the same things that they're going through. And, you know, basically try to incorporate your enthusiasm for the technology also in your production systems because it's not ex um, exactly what you think if the dirty hard work hot sun agriculture necessarily there's so many opportunities in the field of agriculture and that is why um once i know a uh, persons who are interested in, in joining a field of agriculture i kind of invite myself and invite them into the necessary conversation so that they can see where they can make their entry up to yesterday a lady a young lady um, uh, stop me and ask me, you know, how can I get involved? I have this interest and so on. And you begin to have that conversation. And as much as possible, I try to encourage them to get involved. Because, uh, again, it, 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 it's also therapeutic. To work your hand in this soil is very therapeutic. So they might go to my farm and I take off my shoes and walk. They say, this, that's grounded. I mean, you, you, you have to also find meaning in the things that you're doing. All right, and so I like projects. I love taking on projects. My farm is a project for me, a long-term project, but it is it is mine. You know, I, I can do anything else around this space. I can go into office and do work anywhere, um, and I, I just like doing projects. And so my farm is a project for me, but also too, it is a source for my family. It's an, it's an opportunity to bring my family and get them involved. It's quality time. So then we only think of quality time in terms of being able to go to the movies and spend some time in a hotel somewhere. But when, when I have my brothers and sisters and my son on, on, on the farm with me, and I look around and I see my mother too, and her husband, you know, the whole family is the, in that experience. And when I know that, when I see that, I know that I have to produce quality food, but they're eating shit from the farm. And again, these, these are the kind of things that, you know, uh, inspire me. And I hope hopefully that a young person coming up, even in your backyard, to start yeah. here, because that's where I started. I started by um, using old oil kits coming from the chip shop, plant, yeah. pulling them with soil and planting with lettuce, simple things that can come in 30 days to combust before I gravitated to putting on drip lines. I went and I studied on people's farms. I copied. This is not high school anymore where you, you copy and you get caught. Copy a system and go on it every time because farmers are even willing to give you the entire level anyway right and so this is where everything and, and over time you begin to sit down and really listen to the to the, the elders um and, and some of these matters and if it's not farming still please do do something that is meaningful but if not agriculture something that is meaningful because at the end of the day life is short very short span of time I, I am so happy that you you mentioned a meaningful one. On that note, um, I want to take this opportunity again to thank you so much. Uh, but those last words that you imparted are so crucial and very important. Uh, whatever you're doing, um, if it's not uh, contributing to the fabric of your society, if it's not building uh, your communities up, then, then most importantly, that is where uh, we continue to see a breakdown in the fabric of our society. Uh, but thank you so much for this amazing conversation um on agriculture we do um we do have a question and i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, mm. take that question the question is from james knight and he says what can we produce for what market are we producing especially the local market mm. that is a good question that is a question that the consultant has been asking 
unfortunately in the region, and if you look back even as far back as the mercantile um, period up until today, uh, we have not had a good handle on the domestic market. Uh, and so, as I said earlier, I don't know if Mr. Knight was in at the time, a lot of times we're producing uh, things just because we can produce it and then we finally have so much on hand at the same time, and suddenly we don't have it. Yes. And, and it's because of market information, right? Uh, a lot of times, I, I, to answer the question about what can we produce, we can produce almost anything. The question is, should we produce it at this time, or should we produce it in an organized way so that you can meet the demand of your market and those of your, of your, your neighboring islands? Um, in some case, we produce a myriad of crops. We produce sweet potatoes very, very, very effectively. We produce watermelons, we produce tomatoes, and so on, right? And of course, we can do a lot better in those areas once we are properly organized and you have the institution and the support set up and the financing to go with it. But uh, there, there is no real limit unless there's an issue of climate and we're not, um, first of all, we don't have the, the, the knowledge of a particular crop item, but most of what we eat, we can, we, we can produce it, right? In, in the Caribbean, in the region. I remember, when I was in uni at West Indies, you know, one of the things that a uh, 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 visiting uh, guest lecturer told me that they had so many fruits and food just spoiling in areas like Dominica that never makes its way even up to or, you know, the islands because of transportation issues and so on. But so across the region, what we what we can produce effectively here in St. Kitts, somebody else can. You know what I mean? Like Dominica and so on. But again, Production is more than just what we can produce in terms of what we have knowledge of producing and the guys produce, but it is a factor also of the infrastructure in place. Okay, there's something that um, my farmers constantly remind me that we can, no, no way in the world uh, is anybody producing the same thing all through the year. It's a period of time because of extreme weather pattern is a cutoff. But what they have over us in the region is those storage infrastructure storage so that they can buy themselves through a two three months period while they, do, they pass through the extreme drought or this weather pattern of some kind and then again move into production cycles again All right and so again it has it has to be a real conversation about what it takes to really produce one you need to have to have a market to produce for these are decisions, policy decisions that must be made. And there must be um, an exercise of political will in the first instance. The, the reports have indicated time and time again that there is no lack of programs. We have seen over six programs within the last four to five years or so in the Caribbean. But what, what we've seen is that there's a lack of investments as it relates to infrastructure, lack of limited financing to support these things. We have seen deficiency in the coordination and the organizing of the, the communities behind production. And we've seen a myriad of challenges over time. So it's not that we can't produce. It's that we have not yet really um, done justice to the implementation of some of these initiatives and so on and provide the support where we really need to be supported. And I think there is a kind of lacuna in the minds of our own people mm -hmm. about our farmers and how they are because we still have this dirty image in our head, this hard work image in our head, as much as we like to talk differently. Farmers are important when we have crisis. When we have when we had COVID-19, we were a food army. When we had um, storms, when we had oil crisis in the 70s, when structural adjustment programs came on in the 1990s and the and, and late 80s, when, when, when we had um, the World Trade Center bombing and all these things, the media across the region and locally all were calling on farmers to produce. And for that period of time, we saw money became available, capital became available to, 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 to stimulate production. We call them stimulus packages. But as soon as, as soon as the boats start coming again, we, we see that there is no sustained program to continue this thing. The structural we adjustment programs eroded, eroded. Mm -hmm caused great government intervention in the in the 70s and, and, and early 80s. But then in, in the latter part of the 80s and, and 90s, we saw that it caused government to pull out of, of the environment to offer extension services, storage facilities, and all these things that are necessary to advance and promote local production. Again, time has really come. Time has come across the region 
And I'm saying here, local in St. Kitts and Nevis, we can take the agricultural practitioner seriously. And let us put real policies in place, real measures in place. The talking, the grandstanding to say that you're going to make farmers millionaires, this has been happening across the region whenever there was a change in political government, in government, right? But then when it comes to the will to implement, putting the institutions in place, the legal framework in place, the policies, the financing mechanisms, we've called here locally to set up a facility that allows farmers to get revolving loans at the start of every crop cycle and season. And to me, over time, with these measures, these acts have been have fallen on their face. But these are serious measures because you look as far as Asia and so on, persons raise, uh, raise their families for, for generations on these kind of schemes because they start the production cycle with, with, with assurance that they will be supported financially. And by the end of the season, they would have paid back off these loans effectively to start again. Therefore, making access to food and food security really in their areas. But here, lip service, you are not seeing any serious organization, no serious participation. It's a consultation, but you need active participation of the farming community. You know, in our instance, in terms of organized production, we've seen a problem as well, as mentioned by one of our um, farming heads, that we've seen an undermining of the organizations that are that, that, here to support agriculture. And so right now, if we're not promoting the institutions and the organizations for, for, for that, that, that um, enhances and keep the farming group together, then what are we talking about when we're looking for a productive force for farming culture? And so those are some of the things that really, you know, jump out at me if mm -hmm. we were to ask whether we are truly serious about agriculture. All of the meetings we are going to, they are packed with non-farmers, they're packed with technocrats making decisions, discussing, uh, and so on. And sometimes, when you get a chance to enter those rooms, you recognize they're talking to you with so much authority, right? As if they're doing it themselves, they're farming themselves, and they're telling you you're wrong. It is not so. But they're not practitioners, and you can't convince them otherwise. And again, you have to begin to open up these rooms. Farmers are knocking on these doors and say, let us in. Please let us in. Understood. Otherwise, <laughs> don't want to say what, what the next step is. We have one uh, final question that we're going to take, and this question is from uh, Devron. His question is, how effective are the farmers with innovative and sustainable farming to advance their product? And what is being done to diversify the development of crops? Hmm. My experience um, moving around, um, and farms in St. Kitts and in Nevis. Just recently, we, uh, my family who did a tour on Nevis to see what is the difference between uh, our systems and their systems. And in terms of innovation, there is a, an increase in the use of greenhousing on, on the islands, shade housing and greenhousing in terms of farm technology. Um, and I've seen also uh, the increased use of irrigation, especially of Nevis, the more irrigation of farms over the the farms are smaller. And farmers are taking whatever measures they can in terms of other technologies, whether it's with the mulching plastics and, and, and the irrigation lines and so on, to make sure they, they, are, they, they apply the trade properly. Um, in terms of, of diversifying, I mean, the crops we are focusing on is, is what we have chosen in terms of diversifying from the traditional crops in the first instance, like the coffee and the bananas and the sugar, which were export-oriented crops in the first instance. And so some of these crops that we are, are producing now is, is, is what we, we are trying to decrease in terms of the food import bill, right? And so we are, we are promoting some of these things. So already that process has, has started for some time now. What we, what we need to do in these areas is become more efficient in, in our production system, becoming more organized, and that, and that is coming behind the well, same production goals and agenda for the season and so on. And of course, this will take leadership. One of the most essential things that is lacking in the agricultural sector is leadership, right? Sustained leadership. And despite who comes out, who goes, it's supposed to have mechanisms in place that keep that this consistency, that the knowledge and everything is passed uh, pass forward. But we are already diversifying. There's, a, um, there's innovation 
in the, uh, in the agriculture sector here in many respects. I don't have enough time to give you the full litany of it. But as, as far as I'm concerned, even in machinery, uh, I've gone and, I've gone and, and farmers farm and I see excavators. Um, I've seen large equipment to, to do what they're doing. So the harvesters, you know what I mean? So that what will take you um, two days or three weeks to harvest in terms of potatoes is happening in one morning because they have the technology now so that they can and put them into storage. I see farmers now incorporated um, trending crop with storage where they have their farms are their place of residence so they have ease of access. In fact, only one of the discussions in our group so, um, indicated that if the farmers don't have proper storage, if they don't have six months worth of supplies before the farming season starts, you're already behind, you're already late, and you won't be effective. The second thing that I said to that is, if you don't have proper storage for when you harvest and produce, then you don't have to always go to your field to collect food to take to the supermarket. And you will take them from your storage place. Then something is off. And you should be going to your storage and not to the field to take food to the market. Because if you have to go to the field, you're already late again. All right, and so these are the kinds of conversations and not just the technology, but innovation in thinking and, and, in, in, and, and, and making your, your you know, business file your operation if it is such a world. All right, and so these are the kind of conversations we are having. Of course, the, 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 our organization is very much open up to learning, and hopefully, we can be able to network with agencies across the region that I'm, can I'm so help to offer some of that kind of. Of, of um, technical know-how. I'm so happy that you mentioned that because we have a question coming in from Faith Roach and her question is right in line with your re just uh, recent statements. It says, will the consortium seeks to establish networks with other Caribbean regions to help alleviate the situation of glut locally? We, we, we are currently reaching out um, using our, our, our friends in, in other parts of, of the region to connect us with other agencies. Because we must learn how other persons are, other countries are doing things. We must learn from each other. And one of one of the historical problems of the, of the region is that we've been isolated um, in, so, in so many ways. And that, you know, to take, and everybody wants to be the first, the innovator, to say, I, I did it, and I'm the only one doing it. We're not that arrogant in the organization of the consortium. We, we would like to learn from you and everything that we can teach you, we can teach you. Because it's just for the benefit of all. And so if I could reach out and get connection, for example, with the Barbados Agricultural Society, the Jamaica Agricultural Society, to help us to develop offices institutionally, so that we could provide better service to our members and to the wider community, of course, I run to that opportunity. Because we are that open, because we want to do better. This is our livelihood, you know. Right? And anything that we can do to enhance our members, we will do it. Right? And now it's, 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 it's good, in good standing. Right? Mm -hmm. But this is this is our, our part of our um, outlook. We've indicated earlier that part of our mandate is to network. The four pillars I explained earlier when we started, that networking is one of those things because we understand knowledge, best practices can be transferred and so we must avail ourselves to those to those things. So any agency, whether it's an allied agency working here in St. Gis and Nevis, or regionally, or any institution set up to support agriculture at any island or whatever, even if we have to come to be students in your in your rooms, we'll go. And that is the that's the, that is the basic philosophy and, yeah. and understanding in the organization. Right? And hopefully one day we could return the same to other institutions and other persons. Wonderful. We have a number of persons who have been uh, logged on to this conversation from across the region. One of those persons happens to be the uh, Junior Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries in the British Virgin Islands, Dr. The Honorable Carl Dawson. Uh, we want to thank him uh, for joining this conversation and, and, and paying attention to the narrative. Uh, we have a number of persons, as I said, uh, from uh, across the region, Antigua, uh, Bermuda is here as well, Cayman Islands, uh, Turks and Caicos, and of course the British Virgin Islands. And we do have persons uh, from the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, so once again, uh, welcome to Dr. The Honorable Carl Dawson, Junior Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries in the British Virgin Islands. Mr. Alfred, I have to ask you, as we wind down the conversation, we just have a, a few more short minutes uh, before our time is up. Uh, but in 2024, in hindsight, um, 
with all the work that the consortium is doing and all the efforts that are being made, what would you essentially like to see for agriculture across the region? What is your 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 goal and your essentially your prayer when it comes to agriculture? So I, the last part of your question was missed, I understand. I heard what is the goal for agriculture across the region, our vision? It, it, essentially, what is the goal? What would you like to see um, done for agriculture in the region for 2024? What is your ultimate prayer for the industry? You see, uh, the, all of the developmental literature, um, starting with the works of even Arthur Lewis and them, have indicated that there is no true economic growth in the region where you have one uh, sector moving ahead of agriculture. Uh, whether it was industrialization, or whether, as we are speaking in these days of, of um, tourism uh, area, that if you advance one at the cost of the next, then you won't have real growth across the economy as uh, a whole. And, that is, and, and, and the reason for that is very simple, because even, even if you're going in one area, globally, food, Path is going up sort of fast um, and increasing rate. And so my my goal really essentially is to see greater investments in the people, in our own people. Because a lot of times we, we, we focus on these shiny things. In, in the 1970s, um, it, it was referred to as those white elephant projects, right? And so if you see a white elephant, you know what it is. The you 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 see projects. Come on, come along uh, for a moment, and they are supposed to be the panacea. They're supposed to solve all of the problems, like tourism in our case. But we see what happened with COVID, and we know, you know, tourism got shut down and, and everything else. But we have to rely on in terms of our people. And so, for effective and sustained economic growth, and for poverty alleviation to really happen, it must be about food security. And if it's going to be about food security, then those persons who are on the front line to produce the food, you must be invested in. We must not be afraid to invest in our own people because all of the tax holidays that we've given, some of these transnational corporations, some of them even take loans from our local banks as well. And many of them have, uh, has fall, fall, um, fell under as a result um, of, of bad management and other practices over the region. Our farmers and our people still remain. And so we've been trying to, to incorporate our people into industries and nothing is wrong with going out to services and, and tourism and so on. But it can't be that we are pursuing a unilateral economy, but we have to pursue dual economy. Farming must be center because if you're talking about the leaving of property, then growth in food production is a must. Therefore, empower the farmers, empower the fishers. In Saint and Nevis, there's basically only, only a few persons that are being productive. Most others are administrative. Hmm. It's not me who says so. It's the reports of the region by the, 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 the private sector organizations. When you're looking at my country in particular. If you're looking for productive, you're looking at the fishermen and the farmers. Maybe you're looking at the caribou's and maybe the industrial estates up there, but most of those industrial estates companies are not from here, right? And so if you're going to make real investments and see real growth, then you have to start with the, the, the lower class. If you raise the lower um, portion of people, then everybody get, get, get a rise. Well and said. so I, I would really like to see that investments in agriculture, uh, agriculture from the infrastructure starts happening. I would like to see better linkages, forward and backward linkages in the agricultural sector. I would like to see better clarity in terms of the market and better connections in the old domestic market and change that age, age old paradigm. I would also like to see that we are setting up mechanisms to make sure that we are financing our farmers and, and our producers very well. And, and to take away that age old stigma um, by implementing these things. Incentives must be made available, just like when we make incentives for these large hotels. Incentives must be made. To date, we're still having problems to get them to put things in place to make duty free. On, on things like our chapters and so on. I mean, this should not be, this not being high science, right? If we come out of a COVID period, for example, and the chapters on the island, the chapters on the island 
if 90% if of them are down and they ask for assistance, incentivize them so that we start production. And that's one of the reasons why our production here is so, so late, right? Because we have our private sector persons basically in a state jacket. And I hope, I'm hoping tremendously that we are not just, just, just placating and making statements and attending these meetings, but when we come back here, there's no real will to implement them. I hope that we can empower the farmer, put power and control in the hands of the farmer and the producer and our entertainers and our cultural experts to make sure that we're producing local. Wonderful. Uh, Mishak Alford, I want to thank you so much for your passion and purpose uh, as it pertains to agriculture. And of course, we hear the consortium as well as the farmers uh, within the the very best as you continue to uh, uh, forge forward um, with this very uh, uh, pivotal um, industry. I also want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of our guests from across the region for tuning in. Uh, it has been an absolutely meaningful conversation, uh, one that I'm sure we, we will have to continue uh, because this is of paramount importance to us. Uh, I have been uh, your host for today, your guest host, Ron Grant out of Tortola in the Virgin Islands. Again, you've been watching Territory Talks. Thank you all for your time. Do have a beautiful rest of the day, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.